Bé, bona tarda. Bona tarda a tothom. Iniciem una nova edició dels debats d'educació. Ho fem novament en aquest magnífic auditori del Museu d'Art Contemporani de Barcelona, que ha esdevingut l'escenari habitual de debats d'educació. Hem d'agrair, per tant, novament i per començar, al MACBA la seva col·laboració en aquesta iniciativa i les facilitats que ens dona obrint-nos les portes sempre en aquest esplèndid punt de trobada i també facilitant-nos l'enregistrament i, per tant, la posterior difusió d'aquests debats, la qual cosa també és molt important per nosaltres. Debats d'educació és una iniciativa de la Fundació Jaume Bofill i dels Estudis de Psicologia i Ciències de l'Educació de la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. Aquesta iniciativa es va posar en dansa l'any 2003, per tant ja portem un recorregut, jo diria que important. Ens trobem en la novena edició d'aquests debats que en aquest trajecte han mantingut el seu propòsit inicial, obrir un espai per la discussió amb rigor i la conscienciació de la societat en general i de les institucions, dels professionals, dels líders d'opinió, entorn de les qüestions crítiques que afecten el present i el futur de l'educació com a motor de les polítiques de desenvolupament i de sostenibilitat social. Debats d'educació és un fòrum obert a la comunitat educativa en el seu sentit extens que busca la sensibilització entorn dels reptes que interpel·len el nostre sistema educatiu en una societat complexa com la nostra i en un context polític i social com el que ens toca viure. Per aquest propòsit, aquest curs ja hem comptat amb la intervenció de diferents especialistes, de diferents experts. Vam tenir el mes de novembre el professor Emèrit de la Facultat d'Educació de la Universitat de Stanford, el professor Larry Cuban, amb qui vam abordar els dilemes polítics i docents de l'ús de les tecnologies de la informació i la comunicació a l'aula. També hem parlat de l'evolució de les polítiques d'educació prioritària davant el repte de la igualtat de la mà de Genifs Rocher, professor de la Universitat París 8, Sant Denís, i més recentment, el passat mes de març, d'algunes de les qüestions que afecten els límits de l'aprenentatge en el nostre temps a partir de la idea de l'aprenentatge invisible que ens va suggerir el professor Cristóbal Cobo, investigador de l'Oxford Internet Institute. Els que no hi vareu poder assistir o els que desitgeu recuperar qualsevol d'aquestes ponències, sabeu que les trobareu sempre molt fàcilment a la web dels debats d'educació. El debat que us proposem avui manté el nostre compromís ferm d'incorporar òptiques alternatives que podem obtenir d'experiències rellevants provinents del context internacional. En el cas d'avui, volem fer atenció a la qüestió de la segregació escolar i específicament a una de les alternatives amb què als Estats Units s'hi ha donat resposta. Us proposem d'apropar-nos a l'experiència de les Magnet Schools des del coneixement expert que ens pot oferir el nostre convidat, el professor Gary Orfil. La conferència, però, i en això ens hem de disculpar, serà en anglès i no pas en castellà, tal com erròniament deia el targetó que alguns de vosaltres heu rebut. Disculpeu-nos, per tant, però en qualsevol cas sabeu que, com sempre, disposeu del sistema de traducció simultània per al que us resulti més còmode. Abans de donar la paraula al professor Orfil, l'Ismael Palacín, director de la Fundació Jaume Bofill, us el presentarà amb més deteniment i, així mateix, la qüestió que li hem demanat que abordi avui. Ismael, doncs. Moltes gràcies, Josep Maria. Moltes gràcies a tots, a totes les que heu vingut. De veritat que per nosaltres és un... És un privilegi que seguiu els debats i us animeu, com sempre, a recomanar-los, a reenviar els documents, a subscriure-us al butlletí per rebre-ho també en escrit, a fer un ús, aquells que sou formadors de mestres o formadors universitaris, a fer un ús dels vídeos acumulats, ja que donen 
els debats donen per bastant de debat. Bé, per centrar el tema abans de presentar el professor Orfil, plantejaria un debat clàssic aquests darrers anys, no? La tensió entre elecció de centre per part de les famílies i equitat o segregació. Des de fa anys es defensa que el fet que les famílies puguin escollir en un grau més alt que l'actual o que el que hi havia hagut a quin centre aniran els seus fills és un valor. És un valor que correspon a una preocupació creixent de les famílies que cada vegada creuen més que l'escola a la que vagi el seu fill determinarà més enllà de les seves pròpies capacitats la qualitat escolar i l'èxit escolar que tingui i també hi ha molta gent que defensa que escollir centre pot ser un vector de propiació d'identificació de les famílies amb l'escola, és a dir, que en el moment en què una família li deixem escollir centre fa que aquella família hi projecta uns valors educatius exerceix aquell compromís aquell potencial de compromís que una família pot tenir amb les seves escoles i això afavoreix potser que en la línia de l'autonomia de centres tinguem escoles que tinguin projectes propis, que tinguin projectes diversos i que d'alguna manera interactuïn amb les famílies. Però aquesta corresponsabilitat, aquesta elecció de les famílies es tensiona amb la segregació. És a dir, es donen dinàmiques en les que unes famílies sabem que tendeixen a anar a uns centres i unes de les famílies tendeixen a anar a uns altres. És a dir, tenim el que en diem composicions socials empobrides, tenim segregació en alguns centres. Recentment, precisament ho podeu també trobar al web, hem publicat un estudi, una recerca, que es diu Dilemes en l'elecció de centre escolar, dirigida per Miquel Àngel Alegre, que precisament el que es planteja és com les famílies de Barcelona, a partir de 6.000 qüestionaris, trien o descarten centre. I molt breument, per contextualitzar aquí a Barcelona, diríem el que diu la recerca és, en primer lloc, les famílies descarten més que trien i descarten uns centres molt determinats. D'aquests centres és dels que ens parlarà avui el doctor Orfil i en els que s'adrecen les Magnet Schools. En segon lloc, la recerca diu que tenim una part important de famílies, potser podríem dir un 20%, que no trien centre. És a dir, que matriculen l'alumne en el centre del costat i no s'ho pensen un temps abans com les famílies més instruïdes. Fa poc un periodista de La Vanguardia deia no, no és veritat que els alumnes pobres i immigrants es concentrin en uns centres, són els alumnes de famílies més instruïdes els que es dispersen i deixen en aquests altres alumnes en el costat. Aquesta és una visió més real. I després, quan hem preguntat a les famílies per què descarten centre, diuen que és en funció de la proximitat i la llunyania, en funció en segon lloc de la composició social, és a dir, de de si precisament hi ha segregació o no, i en funció, i després diuen també el projecte educatiu i la qualitat dels mestres, tot i que quan preguntem més a fons diuen que no saben ben bé en què consisteix ni com valorar-ho. Per tant, la composició social és un factor determinant que quan hi ha l'acció de centre, si no hi ha mesures, anem a dir, de gestió d'això, pot acabar-nos creant una doble xarxa, una xarxa segregada, una xarxa, anem a dir, empobrida, escoles que entren en una espiral de desprestigi en les que a partir d'aquí és molt difícil anem a dir revertir això ni amb qualitat ni amb més mestres i hi ha altres escoles anem a dir que acullen una mostra anem a dir segregada en l'altre sentit d'alumnes potser de famílies més privilegiades i aquesta tensió de diferenciació abans potser parlàvem que estava entre l'escola pública i l'escola concertada però ara també ens la comencem a trobar entre unes públiques i unes altres públiques el projecte Magnet Schools, que ens presentarà, del que ens parlarà avui el nostre ponent, ens ha semblat un model representatiu molt atractiu, té visió comunitària, al mateix temps dona un enfoc de l'equitat a través de l'excel·lència i no a través de mecanismes només compensatoris i a sobre vincula molt la corresponsabilitat entre diferents actors d'escola amb altres partenariats. Precisament d'aquí poc la Fundació Jaume Bofill impulsarem un programa de Magnet Schools a Catalunya i en els primers centres d'excel·lència amb què hem parlat han demostrat una predisposició molt alta i avui esperem que que realment ens inspiri i ens doni un anàlisi crític i profund en aquesta trobada. Per presentar el ponent, ja molt directament, diria el professor Orfil, és professor d'educació, dret, ciències polítiques i planificació urbana a la Universitat de Califòrnia, de Los Angeles, és codirector de la institució de Civil Rights Project, 
ha tingut un paper destacat en l'estudi dels drets civils, la política educativa, la política urbana i la igualtat d'oportunitats de les minories als Estats Units i ha fet recerques que han tingut un impacte enorme tant en polítiques educatives, públiques, com en els drets jurídics en general. És un perfil molt complet. Podríem dir que és un acadèmic, també és un emprenedor, ha potenciat molts projectes de Magna Schools i no sé si m'atribaria a dir que també és un activista social i educatiu en el sentit més fort de la paraula. És a dir, ens oferirà, jo diria, visió, discurs, anàlisi i també pràctica. Bé, moltes gràcies i us deixem amb el professor. It's a great pleasure to be with you tonight, and when I saw the rain on the way over, I thought, well, there'll be three or four people here. This is a tribute to the seriousness of thought in this community that so many people would come out on such a dark, cold, wet evening, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with you, and I'd like to express my appreciation to the foundation um, for the invitation, to the Open University, for their co-sponsorship, to the museum, and to all of you. So let's get into some really complicated questions. Um, we have faced a dilemma in the United States for a very long time of how to deal with equity in our schools. Equity in our schools is extraordinarily important because we don't really practice equity in anything else. <laughs> we, we just don't have very much in the way of social policy. We're lacking in many of the social policies that are common in Europe. And there is a strong belief in private markets and uh, individualism in our society that does not provide for a broad range of social supports. Um, but this is counterbalanced to a significant extent by two things that are distinctive about our society. A very strong commitment to public education as a central feature of the society. We're a society of immigrants um, that had to come together from many different um, destinations all over the world and become uh, uh, one society to at least to a reasonable extent. And the public schools play a central role in that process. They have played a central role in mobility, um, particularly in early generations when there was a great deal of social mobility in the United States. Um, there's less now. Um, but they are also a central belief in our society about opportunity, that education really is transformative and that it can really make a vast difference. And this has always been in conflict with um, other elements uh, in our history our, our, we were founded in a racially divided society. We conquered the land from the Indians and treated them very badly. Um, we um, instituted slavery almost immediately after the, United, after the colonies were settled in the United States and had to fight a civil war to end it. Um, and we've always had very deep racial and ethnic divisions among certain groups that were excluded, and that particularly African Americans in the South and the East and um, the Mexican American population in the Southwestern part of the United States, and part that was originally Mexico before the, the war with Mexico. Um, we also have, uh, the, uh, which is a very distinctive feature of our society, a very strong emphasis on rights. Um, the foundational part of our society is an emphasis on individual rights in our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. And the main result of our Civil War were certain kinds of protections of rights that were written into the Constitution in three big amendments, most important of which said there must be equal protection of the laws for all groups of people in the society, which became the basis for the Civil Rights Revolution that occurred in the middle, 19, in, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, we went through two periods of tremendous transformation in terms of race. The first was the Civil War, of course, where we, we had one of the most violent civil wars in the history of the world. One, one person died for every nine slaves that were freed. Uh, and it was a tremendously destructive civil war. Um, 30,000 people died in a couple of days just in one battle, for example. It was uh, unbelievably uh, savage. That changed our constitution, ended slavery, but after that, um, virtual serfdom was reimposed in the South. Uh, 
uh, an apartheid system was created where public education was forbidden um, or completely segregated. Um, and in terms of the schools, there were 17 states that had a history of slavery before the Civil War that instituted rigid racial separation of, of students in schools. And where this was not done by law, it was done by practice in most of our big cities. Um, residents were segregated and schools were segregated. There was a systematic inequality. So when the Supreme Court decided in, the, in, in 1954 that that was a violation of our Constitution, they basically decided that 17 states had systems of education that were immoral, unjustifiable, could not be sustained. And it began to trigger a social movement that by the 1960s um, transformed our country in deep ways. It really ended apartheid in the southern states in, this, in the way that law was being used to rigidly separate people in every aspect of life. Um, but it didn't complete the transformation in any way, nor did it really reach into a lot of the deep problems of separation that were based on housing and other forms of discrimination in our big cities. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story of how choice was used um, both to foster segregation and then to try to undo it, and then once again it was used in a way that, that began to intensify racial stratification. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated story, so bear with me, but it's a story that I think has some lessons. Now, those of us who do studies and go around the world, or even go around our country, since we have 50 different educational systems in the United States, each of our states has a quite different system, um, realize that lessons don't transfer easily. So I'm not, telling, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to tell you what we've learned painfully over a half century of experiment with trying to think through the relationship between some of these issues. So civil rights has been a basic issue in the United States since the Civil War. The modern civil rights revolution began with the Supreme Court decision in 1954, which basically delegitimized the whole practices of race in 17 of our states. Education was fundamental um, and was essential to the struggle ever since. We've been fighting over this issue for a half century since the Supreme Court outlawed segregation in the South and eventually extended that into our big cities. Um, African American or black students and Latino students have been isolated in very inferior schools. It's not ambiguous, it's dramatically evident. Um, the teachers are less qualified, less experienced, the curriculum is more limited, the level of competition is lower, the test scores are different. All of the major inputs and all the major outputs are distinctive. Um, and these schools are not segregated just by race or ethnicity. They're almost always segregated by poverty as well. And for Latino students, they're often what we call triply segregated by, by ethnicity, by poverty, and by language. And those schools rarely perform um, in any kind of equivalent way. And they are also the schools where our dropout crisis is concentrated and inequality is pretty profound. Choice policies were not the norm in American society. American society created universal public education um, in, the, in, in the 19th century. Um, beginning in some of the eastern states in the, early, in the 1830s and 40s, and by the end of the 19th century, we had universal public education almost everywhere. But in the first third of the 20th century, we created universal free secondary education. Um, but it was not equal, and it was segregated. Um, there were uh, many kinds of relationships between segregation and choice over time that we'll describe in a, that I'll describe in a minute. Um, it's been connected to struggles over um, another reform wave, which was basically an anti-government, pro-market reform uh, movement that has deep roots in our society as well. There's, there's great suspicion of government and um, great, much more respect for private markets than in many other societies. So th these, these issues have been present for a long time. You can have, choice can become a, a tool for stratification or for equity. It depends on how choice is done. 
Choice itself can have millions of different meanings, depending on how you do it, for whom, what are the real choices that are offered, under what conditions are the choice offered, with what information is the choice offered. There's many dimensions that shape whether or not uh, a choice tends towards equity or tends towards stratification. So we've had half century with different experiments of this sort. Um, the reason that segregation is so important for us is that it is a fundamental structure of our society. I think it is of every society, but in different ways. But ours is by race and ethnicity to a considerable extent, interacting with class. Our pub public schools are the dominant instrument for socialization. We have a small private school sector. Um, our private schools educate only about one-tenth of our students. We don't have what you have with a public-private. We don't subsidize religious schools in the United States, with rare exceptions. And they, religious schools um, educate only 8% of our students. And there's only about 2% that are in private, um, uh, non-religious schools. So what happens in the public schools matters tremendously. And public schools have uh, tremendous support in this country, in our country. We have, um, as education, as, as our struggles of education go on, education has become much more important. All the gains of our economy have gone to people with post-secondary education now for the last 40 years. The, the real level of income for people with secondary education has gone down uh, dramatically. And for those who don't finish secondary education, which includes, for example, almost half of the of the Latino and African American males in our country, uh, it's gone down a lot. Both employment and real income have gone down pretty drastically. So education is increasingly strongly related to stratification and opportunity. And we have a transforming society. When the civil rights revolution was happening in the 1960s, about one-eighth of our students were non-white. Now about 45% are non-white, and it's growing. We have already a number of states that have a majority of non-white students, and we will have many more. Within the next few years, we will have a majority of non-white students nationwide. The state of California has about two-thirds non-white students, biggest state. <clears throat> so the reason that segregation is so important is that it's related to opportunity in very profound ways in the United States. Our involvement with this issue has been consistent. The Civil Rights Project was created at Harvard University 15 years ago to try to understand and to give a continuous assessment to conditions of equity and opportunity across racial and ethnic lines in our society. We've commissioned over 450 studies since that time. We published a lot of books that relate to this issue, um, and you can. I'll sh when we come to the end of the talk, I'll show you the website where you can access m a lot of this information. And we publish a report every month or so on the condition of integration policy as it develops around the country. It develops in many ways. This shows you the changing racial composition of the United States public schools. Between 1968 and 2004, the number of white students went down by 29%, the number of black students grew by 22%, and the number of Latino students grew by 380%. <laughs> this is a great migration, from, primarily from Mexico and Central America. And Latinos became our largest minority group within the last few years. <clears throat> In the western part of the United States, there are now um, six or seven times as many Latinos as African Americans. Um, and we have a, a, um, a, a society from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast that is predominantly non-white, with Latinos as by far the largest group, and the most segregated, both by race and by poverty. We learned that if you're going to deal with segregation, you have to deal with it seriously. If you just announce a principle, it doesn't work. Um, there's a lot of deep structures that sustain and expand segregation. Um, and they are based on things like the fears that were mentioned in this survey that, that was done here about families not wanting to go to schools of different racial and ethnic 
groups because they have stereotypes and fears about those kinds of contacts. Um, you have to change these patterns, you have to have a systemic and lasting effort. Um, if you do that, you can have substantial impacts, especially if you create conditions where people confront those fears and stereotypes in a situation where there are positive outcomes, <coughs> which is one of the central goals of magnet schools. Oops. <laughs> I almost finished the lecture quickly. <laughs> We had great tension in our country over man mandatory policies for, for desegregation. The Supreme Court um, ordered mandatory busing, as it's called, um, in the late 1960s. And many of our big cities were desegregated very rapidly by forced transfer of students from one neighborhood to another, um, and also of teachers. Um, and that really made drastic changes in the level of segregation in the country. It also created a great deal of conflict and created the stage in which the magnet school programs emerged. <clears throat> Choice evolved in this, in, in this context in a number of stages. The first one was just um, what we called freedom of choice or open enrollment. Um, it was invented in the South in the 1950s and early 60s, and it was intended to create a minimal level of integration. In the South, we had separate schools for blacks and whites. They were serving the same cities, the same neighborhoods. Um, students were transported to one or the other. So what the what the conservatives in the South decided to do was to say, well, we'll just offer students a chance to, to transfer between those two systems of schools. The, the net effect of that was almost nothing um, because none of the whites transferred to the black schools. Um, so those schools remained completely isolated. Um, and very few black students or Latino students in the places where there were Latinos transferred to the white schools because they were not welcome, they were isolated, um, they were not treated well, their parents weren't treated well if they made those choices. So basically you had something that was called freedom of choice that produced almost no choice and left segregation almost completely untouched. After 10 years from after the Supreme Court decision, 98% of black students were still in completely segregated schools. So our courts and our educational officials decided in the late 1960s that that had failed. That, that giving everybody a free choice meant virtually nothing given the structure of stratification in the society. Um, and that would not work to actually produce interracial schools. The Supreme Court made a decision in a case called Green in 1968 that said, we must do whatever is necessary to achieve desegregation immediately. And if we have to force students to transfer, that's what we need to do, and this, the faculty as well. And we did that for millions of students in hundreds of school districts in the next five years. Uh, and we, in, during that period, the South, which had been 98% segregated in, in the middle 1960s, became the most integrated part of the United States even though it had much higher black population than any place else. It's a very, very dramatic educational change. But there was a lot of conflict over this. Uh, a new conservative president was elected, Richard Nixon, who rejected this policy. He, he named uh, members of our Supreme Court who differed with it, um, and it was limited within a few years to, to a considerable extent. What happened at that point was the emergence of magnet schools as a possible solution. Because our cities were being required to desegregate students, um, but they were concerned that if they did it in a, in a mandatory way, two things would happen. One of them is they would lose a lot of families that would leave the public school system and <clears throat> go to independent suburban school systems that are also public. but. Uh, different. And another thing that was that they were afraid that um, they would just lose general support for education. So what they, what they did in inventing the magnet schools was to say, 
will try to create integration by choice, but choice of a different sort. <clears throat> we'll try to create genuine educational alternatives that are distinctive, that don't nor or exist in our normal schools, and give parents an incentive to transfer their students. Um, they tended to put the most attractive alternatives in the middle of uh, minority areas where whites would not normally go. But they were being offered very strong incentives in, in schools that, that they and their children wanted to go to. For example, schools where you could do performing arts, where you could learn how to act and sing and dance and, at a professional level, um, or many other kinds of special schools. Um, the federal government came in at this point in part to deal with the conflict, social conflict that was going on in the country and gave money to schools to create new, new educational alternatives. And there were thousands of these schools who were created. Um, <clears throat> we now have about two million students in magnet schools in the United States. It's the biggest system of choice that we have. Now, the condition for them getting the money and for creating these schools was that they had to have a whole set of civil rights policies to ensure that they were actually integrated. Um, and I'll explain those a little bit later. This was followed in the 1990s by a different form of choice called charter schools, which are basically magnet schools without civil rights protections, without the kinds of protections that made it possible to actually integrate the magnet schools. So in the magnet, with the development of magnet schools, the Supreme Court in the, in, in the early 1970s said American cities have to integrate. Um, it violated the Constitution to maintain segregated schools. That was imposed first on the South. And in 1971, 72, almost every major city in the South was forced to integrate on a massive scale almost immediately. Um, in 1973, it was extended to the North in a somewhat weaker form into those states that didn't have a history of, of, uh, of mandated segregation by law. When this happened, some of the older central cities that were very concerned about decline and loss of white students and were already heavily non-white in their enrollment invented magnet schools. Uh, magnet schools were created originally in some of our big industrial cities that were facing desegregation demands. And the federal government provided startup funding for them. And they were required to have certain kinds of policies to assure that they'd be integrated. These are the basic policies that are, were uh, critical to magnet schools being actually integrated. First of all, of course, they must be actually magnetic. They must have something that's actually credible, that people would actually make a choice to attend. You can't just say something's a magnet school and expect people to, to trust their children to it. It has to really be authentic. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, the original policy was that they could not screen students. They could not, it was for the students to select the schools, not for the schools to select the students. If schools can select students, they will screen out disadvantaged students in different ways. The next policy was that if there was more demand for a school than there was, was space, uh, you used a lottery. Um, because if you used anything else, political influence would be brought to bear and people would figure out ways around the system and so forth, especially for the most desirable schools. That it was discovered well before this time that if you're going to have choice, um, it's going to have very unequal social consequences unless you make a, a, a very intense effort to inform the, the less educated and, disadvantaged, and the disadvantaged populations, especially those who don't speak the native language. Um, so there were requirements that you had to inform p parents in their language and there had to be outreach programs and personal contact and recruitment. A very important feature was that uh, it was not um, use, that seats were set aside in these schools to assure that they'd be integrated. In other words, um, if a school was going to be set up, um, there would be a guaranteed number of seats set aside for African-American students or for white students to make sure that it was actually integrated on a substantial level. 
um, not just on a token level, so that the students would not be isolated. Uh, and there, there would be enough, the, th the whole theory of integration effects is that there has to be a critical mass of, uh, uh, of sufficient size to actually make a difference in a school. The idea of desegregation is that you don't create a, you don't assimilate people into pre-existing culture. You create a new school that re reflects the multiplicity of cultures. Free transportation to these schools was required. Um, because if you don't have free transportation and you have residential segregation, then the choice is only being offered on a class basis. It's not being offered to poor people who can't afford to provide their own transportation. So these are the equity provisions that were part of the magnet school movement that made it possible to use choice in a way that actually produced integration. Later, we had the emergence of choice systems in charter schools without um, equity provisions. Our charter schools don't have any of these requirements, basically. They're not required to have free transportation. They're not required to do outreach. They don't have to have plans for diversity. They don't set aside seats. Um, the result of that has been that they tend to increase stratification. Black students in the United States, for example, in charter schools are twice as segregated as in intensely isolated schools as black students in regular public schools. So they make a bad situation worse in terms of segregation because they basically, if you offer a choice and you don't have these kinds of civil rights protections attached to it, choice stratifies. Choice is not a democratic process. It maximizes the advantage of people who have information and and understand complex systems. Um, it, is, it has a lot of power in terms of creating innovation and forcing change. Markets have power, but markets don't tend towards equity. Um, you know, they, they tend towards inequality. Um, so if you're going to use the power of markets and, and the power of disruptive changes in school systems um, and innovation in a way that doesn't stratify, you have to have policies that deal with the negative effects of markets and competition. That's what magnet schools try to do. Pure markets, the theory of pure markets is that um, they are fair because everybody has equal knowledge of alternatives. There's active competition of many suppliers and there's no barriers to entry either in the supply or the con consuming. This is, um, this is Adam Smith. This is microeconomics. Um, the, f the problem is, this doesn't describe the school choice system in any way. Uh, people don't have equal knowledge. They have very systematically unequal knowledge, unless there's a major effort to offset it. Um, there's not active competition. Usually there's only a very limited number of choices, and lots of times the choices aren't even good choices. A choice between a segregated high poverty public school and a segregated high poverty charter school isn't a really very good choice in educational terms. Um, and there are barriers to entry. You can, everybody can't come in and create schools, uh, and schools don't treat all applicants equally. There's discrimination in different ways in school uh, access. So this, is a, this accounts for the fact that relying on a market theory where there really isn't a market conditions tends to produce stratification. You're, you're, you're having an, uh, uh, we often, charter school advocates often talk about this as if it's a real market, but it isn't. Um, it's very, a very limited and skewed market. So in terms of why to worry about this, there are really serious problems about segregation. Segregation is usually present on multiple dimensions. There are, te both teachers and students tend to leave segregated schools and neighborhoods. They're not there because they choose to be there, or they want it to be their destination. I tell people that these schools are more like rivers than islands, that people are flowing through and they're get getting out. Um, and we, our research shows that teachers who aren't experienced aren't really as effective as teachers who are, and in our systems, teachers who are experienced leave these schools, the disadvantaged multiple segregated schools. 
Peer effects are a central element of research on schooling ever since the Coleman Report in the 1960s, which found that if in the first national sample of American school segregation, uh, found that the money that went into schools wasn't nearly as important as who was in the schools. Uh, and it found that aside from the family background, the largest impact on student achievement was the level of education of the other students in the school. Um, the, the peer group had tremendous influence. I think almost everybody understands this about colleges. If you go to a great college that only admits very highly qualified students, you learn a lot from the other students. <clears throat> the same thing is true of other levels of schooling and it's a very important part of the segregation and desegregation effects. What we find is the real curriculum differs tremendously between segregated schools and interracial schools or predominantly white schools. Um, it's li more limited, it's taught at a lower level. Um, the, the, the actual operation in the classroom is less competitive um, in terms of uh, having highly qualified fellow students and the teachers um, are less demanding because student, there's so many students aren't prepared for that level of competition. Another thing that you can't learn in a segregated setting is how to live in an integrated society. If you live, if you grow up in a segregated neighborhood and you go to a segregated school, you don't really know how to function across racial and ethnic lines. It's something that's not native to people. It has to be, it's something that has to be learned. And the earlier you learn it, the more effective the learning is. There's a great deal of evidence now that's been accumulated over the last 50 years to show that integrated schools have greater opportunities in the United States. And you can see a great deal of this information. The National Academy of Education, which is a group of 100 leading educators in the United States, tried to summarize all this evidence. Um, and there's a website where you can look at that. Um, our project coordinated a brief that went to the United States Supreme Court that was signed by 553 social scientists from 201 universities summarizing what we learned in the last 50 years about these issues. There's basically a lot of evidence to show that being in a, in a school that is um, integrated by race and social class offers better educational opportunities. Only part of it's measured by test scores. A lot of it's measured by whether you graduate, whether you go to college, whether you succeed in college, and how you do in your later life. There seems to be what are called perpetuation effects. If you, live, if you grow up and develop in a segregated basis, you live that way as an adult. And if you grow up and develop in an integrated basis, your life as an adult is likely to be integrated. Here are some of the things that really need to be done to have good bang at schools. They have to have a good program, and it has to be well done. Uh, we have thousands of them. Uh, some of them are very successful, others of them aren't very, very magnetic. Um, to have a really exciting magnet school that everyone wants to go to, it has to offer something that the other schools don't offer at a level that they don't offer. To do that, you, know, you really need to have a staff that believes in that goal. What we tend to do in our best magnet schools is to create a new school with a new staff, to appoint a principal who is committed to that vision, to let that principal choose a staff. Many teachers want to work in these schools. Typically, when a new magnet school is opened with an exciting theme and a good leader, there are many, many teachers who apply for these positions. In the US, we do not pay these teachers any more money. And they do work harder. Uh, but they have the opportunity to work on something they really believe in with a team of people who believe in it as well, and with a leader who believes in it, and with parents who are all there because they want to be there. So it produces a very positive kind of setting for actually educating people. Now, the magnet programs are added to the regular program. And all these schools still have to meet the requirements of the state laws and, and have regular testing and so forth, but there's something extra added. It may be that they are very advanced scientific training. It may be that it's um, training in government or law. It may be that it's about health care. It may be that it's about uh, the international baccalaureate programs. Maybe for our young children, Montessori schools are very popular and there are magnet 
in our mag magnet schools uh, use Maria Montessori's technique from Italy. Um, there's many, many different kinds of them, hundreds of different kinds. You, almost anything you can think of has been tried someplace. Um, and what works in a different community is, can be quite different than from one community to another. The staff needs to be trained, and they need to have the right equipment to implement the program. Typically, um, estimates are it costs about 10% more to run a magnet school. Um, and a lot of that is startup costs. And this was where the government funding was really important to get through the startup process. Um, there is um, good information and recruitment in good magnet schools and programs. In many of our cities, if you move between neighborhoods or if you, if you uh, move into the city, you have to go to an office where you find out about what choices you have and you are asked to make choices. There's also um, big events where all the magnet schools explain their programs um, to all interested citizens. And then there's person-to-person -person recruitment. Um, there is transportation and um, there is assessment. Um, these, are, these schools are not dismissed from regular accountability systems, which are increasingly rigid in the US, too rigid, many of us think. Um, in choosing how to s who you're going to recruit and how, what lines of diversity you're going to have and so forth, um, typically we've done that by race and ethnicity. But our Supreme Court has limited direct use of race and ethnicity, and there's lots of expl ex exploration going on in other variables. Immigrant status, home language, poverty, the, concept, the poverty of the residential neighborhoods, uh, representation of different parts of the geography of your city. Um, it can be done in many different ways. The important thing is that once you figure out what the dimensions of diversity are that you want to, uh, want to uh, implement, that has to be built into a recruitment process, a plan to, to identify and contact with those parents, and uh, set aside of some seats so that you can be assured that there will be integration and that the, the administrators have um, an incentive to recruit those students rather than just recruit students who would be easier to teach, who would have higher scores. Um, one of the magnets options that's becoming popular in some parts of the country is to use two languages as basic elements and to have students, half of the students from one language group and half from another and have them each learn each other's language in a fluent way in a situation where each language is treated seriously. In all of our desegregation plans, there's usually an emphasis on uh, multicultural education, respecting the history and the culture of the different groups of students that are represented in, this, in the school. Um, whether or not our experience would be directly relevant, of course, is for you to judge. But um, if you are interested, there are many, many experiences that are available to be looked at in the United States. Um, there are two million students in these kinds of schools right now. There is a national association called Magnet Schools of America. Uh, most of our big city school districts that have magnet schools have websites that identify what they do. And many of our magnet schools have websites that explain their program in some, some detail. Um, there are lots of evaluation studies of magnet schools. Magnet schools um, tend to perform somewhat better than regular schools for disadvantaged students, not miraculously better. Um, but like other forms of integration, they tend to have larger effects on some of the other outcomes of schooling, like graduating and going to college. Um, they tend to engage parents quite actively, even though a lot of the parents don't live in the neighborhoods. Um, they have made choices to become involved in a certain kind of educational mission and vision, and there tends to be a high level of parent participation in good magnet schools. Um, so if you're interested, it's probably not very difficult for you to contact people who actually have lived through creation of one sort of magnet school or another. And some of the national associations and researchers would be able to direct you um, uh, into contact with them. Um, as, as I've learned from talking with people here and in Madrid, um, there's many distinctive characteristics of your systems that aren't like ours, but there's probably many things that many kinds of experiences that would be interesting or at least stimulating for you to think about.
So I would say, um, you know, there, American schools um, and educators tend to be interested in communicating and I'd probably be happy to talk to you. We have a lot of re related research on these issues that you can see on our website, um, which is listed here, civilrightsproject.ucla.edu. And it's not just on magnets, and it's not just on integration. It's be on a lot of dimensions of educational equity, including the dropout issue that we've done a lot of work on, um, on, on issues of uh, special education discrimination, on many, many issues, language rights, um, the, the rights of immigrants, children. Um, so we hope you might find something there that you could take advantage of. In, in conclusion, I'd just say, um, in any society that has stratified schools, is going through increasing demogra demographic change, uh, and where there's talk about markets and choice as an educational um, strategy, it's worth thinking about this experience. It's worth thinking about the conditions under which choice is likely to stratify, the, wor the conditions under which it's likely to increase opportunity, and to think hard about if you're going to start doing this, to do it in a way that creates schools that are so interesting and so compelling um, that it creates an, some new possibilities in your society, in your communities, in your neighborhoods. In terms of public schools in the US, many public school systems in big cities and areas that have become increasingly impoverished became discouraged um, and were viewed with a stereotype as having nothing worth the attention of the middle class. One of the things that magnet schools do is to create something that can be very exciting. For example, when a, a school is linked with a university or research group and something that never has been done anyplace else in the city is available at a high level, all of a sudden a public school can become a very interesting and compelling and competitive institution uh, with a staff that is engaged and energized. It's worth thinking about how to channel this power, how to, how to uh, launch it, how to, make, how to create new possibilities in your own society. Um, and um, I would encourage you to carry out this discussion in a deep way. Thank you. Muchas gracias al, al doctor Phil, realmente fantástico. Uh, Antes de... o precisamente para arrancar el debate, para trancar el gel, hemos demandado, como com la ocasión anterior, a dos personas que, que arranquen amb dos preguntas. Son la, la Marta Comas, del Consorcio de Educación de Barcelona, y el Ferran Ferrer, catedrático de Educación Comparada. Las dos seguramente las conoceu prou y son personas que han estado muy compromesas en, en estos debates. Hola, en primer lloc agrair al, al professor totes les evidències que, que ens ha posat sobre la taula per, per eh, valorar bé l'impacte de la segregació i bueno, em toca trencar el gel. Jo volia plantejar des de la perspectiva catalana dues, dos reptes o dues paradoxes que segurament molts de nosaltres ens hem plantejat. Una és des de la perspectiva de la tria de les famílies. És un repte, però alhora és una paradoxa en si mateix, que és com aconseguim fer prou atractives aquestes escoles a les classes mitges quan aquestes, com, com bé ens ha dit en Miquel Àngel Alegre, el que, el que pesa més en la seva elecció de centre és la composició de l'alumnat, com aconseguim fer projectes prou atractius perquè els, la potència d'aquest projecte superi el perjudici. Quan tots sabem que a l'hora de parlar de prestigi, de centre educatiu prestigiós, pesa molt aquest concepte bordià de, de la distinció, d'allò que ens distingeix. Jo he anat a l'escola tal, jo provinc de l'escola qual, i per ser algú distingit, tocat d'aquesta formació, molt sovint eh, això fa que rebutgi certes escoles amb un grau d'heterogeneïtat massa elevat. Com ens ho podem fer? Perquè siguin atractives, prou potents, perquè l'evidència d'uns bons resultats permeti superar la barrera del perjudici i de la composició social. Això per la banda de les famílies que han de triar. Per la banda del sistema també veig una paradoxa, que és com 
dintre del nostre sistema, dintre del nostre servei públic d'educació, amb els constrenyiments que tenim a l'hora del reclutament dels docents, a l'hora de la formació dels docents, del lideratge i de la dificultat per sortir-se d'unes vies, com podem fer magnètiques unes escoles que no se sortin d'aquests raïls? Perquè ens consta que aquí s'han fet esforços amb tot el que són els plans d'autonomia de centres, s'ha fet un finançament superior a certes escoles pels seus projectes d'autonomia, però els hi falta fer aquest salt de fer-les prou atractives, donar-los prou prestigi, tocar-les amb la vareta màgica, que passa per aquest concepte de tria que ha dit vostè, que és que aquí tothom ha volgut anar-hi, també els professors. Un bon líder ha fet el seu equip. I aquesta és la gran barrera del nostre sistema, em sembla. És com una altra paradoxa. Aquestes són moltes preguntes. La veritat és the reality is that it's not easy to do this. It, it's hard. Um, and I think when you're trying to start it, uh, if you want to give prestige to a school in a community where there has been negative stereotypes, you have to do something that's really remarkable. And, but it's not that hard to figure out what that would be. You have to figure out what are the prestigious things in your community that you'd want to attach to a school and then figure out how to do that. For example, uh, if you have a great theater company, if you have a great ballet, and you connect them to a school, um, uh, and you, you, uh, um, you tell people that there is a public school where people can learn how to do something that is remarkable, that is usually something only for the wealthy, um, and that um, you'll find that these institutions are often very excited about being involved with something like this. Um, you know, they, they have a, it gives them an exciting experience and there is talent of many sorts in every poor community that isn't realized or developed. Um, but you, you, when you want to start something like this, you want to find some things that already have prestige and attach it to a, a school that doesn't have prestige. And probably it's best to, for the first ones to start new schools, not to try to convert old schools. So you can have a brand new staff that's excited about it. Um, you can use an old building, but get, you get, often in the US they give it a new name. It might have been called the Johnson School, and, and now it's called the, the um, um, Science Academy, <laughs> or it's called the Academy of the Arts, or it's called something special. Um, schools are about what we believe is going to happen there. What we, you know, schools are dreams in a way. They are self-fulfilling prophecies. And when you can create a brand new school, it's not the building that makes it, it's who is in there and what they're doing. Um, and, um, you know, this is not rocket science to figure out what are really attractive things. How can you get your most prestigious university or some of the people from it or, or the greatest hospital in your, in your city to connect with the school and to become an a ongoing connection that is significant? Um, you know, it doesn't really cost very much more than just running a bad school. Um, and it does create um, a lot of excitement and the excitement spills over to the reputation of the school system sometimes if it's done really well. Um, so I'd say you have to use imagination and you have to be really careful, especially in the first ones, um, to do it well. So that when people walk into that school, they know this isn't just a regular school. There's stuff going on in here that is special, that really wouldn't, people like my family wouldn't get normally. And you also have to make sure that it has a critical mass of middle class people, as well as poor people to start with. Because if you start out a school in a poor neighborhood with all the poor immigrant children and so forth, um, you know, it's not gonna develop that reputation and it's not gonna attract middle class people. So in order to create something that's gonna be very exciting and it's gonna create brand new opportunities for a number of really disadvantaged students and change the position of school in the community, you have to t take some very conscious, calculated steps. You have to have a strategy. Um, 
But once you start thinking about it, the possibilities are tremendous. I mean, sometimes very odd things that I don't especially like really work as magnet schools. For example, in the city of St. Louis, which is a fairly conservative, very conservative white population and a fairly traditional black population, um, they created a school that where everybody had uniforms and they marched around and, and they <laughs> they trained people to go into the military um, and. It turned out that there were many white conservatives that wanted to go there, and many black families that wanted their children to get that kind of training. The school was, was a great success. You have to figure out what would, what would work in your community. Um, the, the, the special thing that the school does doesn't replace the rest of the curriculum. The students are doing other things as well. They're just at a school that they and their families want to be in, and that offers them something extra that they really value. I ara, i ara demanem la segona pregunta en Ferran Ferrer. Hola, bona gràcies, nit. Ferran. Uh, gràcies a vosaltres per convidar-me uh, a fer algun comentari sobre, sobre la intervenció. A veure, um, diverses coses. Evidentment hi ha moltes coses a dir, però intentaré ser molt sintètic amb, les, amb, el que, amb algunes de les reflexions que voldria transmetre. Una, les magnetes es produeixen en un context com és el context dels Estats Units, que no entraré a destacar, però tenen sentit en un context de societats eh, amb importants desigualtats. Eh? No m'imagino parlant de les magnet schools, per exemple, eh, en el model finlandès, per exemple. Eh? Per tant, en aquest sentit, a nosaltres el model magnet és un, és, és un model del qual podem aprendre, que no hem de copiar necessàriament, però que podem aprendre, eh, podríem dir, allò que nosaltres considerem que és interessant. Segona idea que a mi em sembla important. fixeu vos com en el tema de les magnet, en el tema d'equitat i elecció de centre, l'objectiu no és l'elecció de centre. L'objectiu és l'equitat, l'objectiu és la desagregació. I és la, la correcta canalització de l'elecció de centre a través d'aquesta idea d'escola imant, d'escola d'atracció, que fa que finalment puguem aconseguir uns processos de desagregació. Això jo crec que és molt important, perquè davant de discursos en què posen com a objectiu, no com a mitjà, l'elecció de centre, em sembla que, que val la pena destacar-ho. Però fixeu-vos que no elimina l'elecció, eh? sinó que el que fa és canalitzar-la a través d'aquesta, d'aquesta eina. I, I en tercer lloc volia destacar quatre característiques que a mi em sembla que són eh, trencadores respecte a lo que tenim en el nostre país. Eh? La primera eh, que a mi em sembla important és que fixeu que es fonamenta la distribució dels alumnes en funció, la de, l'atracció de, la, en funció de l'atracció de les famílies. És a dir, hi ha tot el debat entre lo que podríem anomenar polítiques d'imposició i polítiques de seducció, les eh, magnet estan més en la línia de les polítiques de seducció, lo qual no vol dir que no hi hagi també una normativa que limiti, eh, podríem dir, a l'accés de determinades famílies a determinats centres. Eh? Però es posa èmfasi en una manera diferent de gestionar l'oferta i la demanda educativa. Una segona característica és el tema de l'heterogeneïtat. L'heterogeneïtat com a característica d'èxit d'un centre. Clar, en el nostre país, més aviat el discurs és a la inversa, no? És a dir, si tu vols tenir èxit en una escola has de tenir nanos molt homogenis, has de fer grups de nivell, en fi, has de fer aquest tipus d'estratègies, no? Al revés, ells, ells fonamenten precisament en que l'escola sigui heterogènia per obtenir èxit. Tercera idea, els resultats. Això s'enfoca a resultats, a resultats avaluables, eh? I, per tant, una magnet no, no és simplement una declaració d'intencions, és també obtenir evidència sobre quins resultats s'obtenen i com, i com aquests resultats milloren. I quarta idea que a mi em sembla també reveladora i significativa, no, fixeu-vos en el títol de la conferència, el subtítol de la conferència, que a mi em sembla tremendament significatiu, eh? en què es diu la innovació com una eina per trencar els processos de segregació. 
Clar, nosaltres quan plantegem tradicionalment la innovació educativa la plantegem simplement com una eina per millorar la qualitat. I en canvi les Magnet plantegen la innovació precisament per contribuir a la cohesió social, a l'equitat, etc. No? Per tant, ens sembla també una idea eh, tremendament suggerent. Finalment, com a, com a idea així motor de totes les Magnet, a mi em sembla que destilen una confiança molt gran en les escoles, en les pròpies escoles, en la capacitat de les escoles per fer projectes educatius innovadors, atractius, etc. No? A mi em sembla que també és un, és un, podríem dir, és un tret distintiu respecte a el que de vegades passa en el nostre país. Penso que aquests són alguns dels aprenentatges que, que podem tenir en el nostre sistema educatiu. Gràcies. I think a central part of what was just said is that this choice is a power. It, it, it is, is a potentially disruptive power. It's a power that can produce change and innovation. If it's not channeled, it may make a bad situation worse. If it is channeled, it has creative possibilities that are important. And thinking about how to do it in a way that taps the energy without getting the inequality of the results is the whole genius of this when it's done the right way. <laughs>